Good morning and welcome to Coffee and Tea with AARP, a bi-weekly program in which AARP Connecticut staff and volunteers talk to leaders about the issues that matter to older adults in our state. My name is Anna Dorgazi and I'm one of the policy and outreach directors here at AARP Connecticut. I'm very excited about our guest today, um, but before we get to him, I'd like to start by introducing my co-host for today, Mary Avery. Hey, Mary. Hey, how are you? I'm great. Um, Mary has been an AARP Connecticut volunteer since 2018, working both on legislative advocacy and community initiatives. She's also a registered nurse who specializes in mental health care, and she teaches nursing students about psychiatric nursing care. Um, before becoming a nurse, Mary worked as a nursing assistant and was a caregiver for her mother who had dementia and needed 24-7 care. Um, Mary is a fabulous advocate and somebody who I turn to for feedback on issues related to health care and caregiving. Um, I'm also really, really excited to welcome today's guest, um, Ernest Tosh. Um, Ernie has been practicing law for over 25 years as a national preeminent authority on nursing home operations. Ernie has testified about industry-wide financial and staffing pr uh, practices to the U.S. Congress and to juries throughout the country. He was recently featured in a Vice News nursing home investigation on how nursing homes hide profits at the expense of their residents. Um, he's licensed to practice law in Arkansas, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Texas, and Wyoming. It's a lot of bar exams. Um, <laughs> and additionally, he co-counsels on cases um, related to nursing home abuse throughout the country. He was just in Connecticut uh, back in January to speak with some of our legislators and policy makers, and we are really excited to have him with us today. So thank you, Ernie. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. So Ernie, you are an expert on nursing home operations. So we wanted to dive right in on some of the questions related to ownership and finances. We in Connecticut in 2003 did pass legislation requiring nursing homes to disclose private equity ownership of the facilities. So I wondered, could you tell us what private equity is and what role it plays in nursing homes in the healthcare industry? Sure. So private equity is just a type of investment vehicle. It is um, as its name denotes private, meaning that um, we cannot see into the private equity pool to see who is investing in that entity. So if you think about a private equity pool is a group of individuals who pull their money together and then they say, OK, now we want to go out and buy you know, businesses in this sector could be dental, could be hospital, could be nursing home. Doesn't have to be healthcare. It could be anywhere that they believe there is significant chance of um, re getting a really good return on their investment. The so, so the private portion is it's very opaque and we can't see who's actually involved. The equity portion just means that they are accumulating money, basically to do these purchases. And so you have these giant investor pools that are completely opaque. We'll just have some generic name like Blackstone, um, you know, Incorporated or something like that. And you don't know who those investors are. Uh, are they qualified to own nursing homes? Um, but they will go out and then purchase you know, in the market that they believe can get them the highest rate of return. Now, one very specific thing about private equity that makes them very different from other forms of investment is that private equity is traditionally not a long-term investor, hmm. meaning they don't purchase a business with the intent of holding it for now until forever you know, and running that business appropriately forever. That's not their deal. Their deal is to get into the market, double or triple their money in four to seven years mm. and get out of the market. So when you think about nursing homes, this is not a mom and pop operation that's been in the family for 30 or 40 years and is tied to the community. This is an entity that is there to make maximum profits 
as quickly as possible and then get out. So how prevalent are is this financing in nursing homes as an industry? Uh, it, it is very prevalent and it is um, accelerating. If you look back just a couple of years ago, um, there were deals across the entire nursing home industry. I think in 2019, it was about $400 million in purchases. By 2022, I believe it was over $1.5 billion in purchases. So it, the amount of money that was flowing in tripled in just a couple of years, and it is continuing to grow. It is um, most, I would say, of the big acquisitions that we're seeing in the last couple of years have been private equity driven acquisitions. It is a big issue. So what percentage of nursing homes are owned by private equity? Is that statistic sort of available? Well, no, it's not. It's very difficult to figure out who private equity is, number one, because their structure is so opaque. So understanding who is private equity mm -hmm. is the first issue. The second issue is um, ownership transparency within the nursing home sector is very, very difficult. Um, you may be able to tell who owns a nursing home by going to CMS's ownership database and it says, oh, it's owned by Granite Incorporated. Well, but who owns Granite? And if Granite is a privately held company, it, you may not be able to figure out who owns Granite. And it may in fact be that Granite is owned by a private equity company. And there may be two or three layers of ownership between the pool and the actual chain and CMS's ownership database doesn't capture that deep of an information. And so trying to figure out which PE pools own which nursing homes is a monumental undertaking to figure that out. Mm, wow. Yeah. And it seems like, I mean, we could probably spend our whole conversation diving into just the private equity mm -hmm. piece of this. Mm -hmm. There have been great articles written in recent years about private equity investment in healthcare overall and you know what that means for the sector. Yeah. Uh, but I want to pivot a little bit and ask you about another type of ownership structure within the nursing home industry. Um, and those are related parties. So within the nursing home industry, um, what are related party entities and how common is it for nursing homes to utilize related parties in their corporate structures? Uh, answering your second question first, uh, how prevalent are they? Related parties are everywhere. Um, any, any chain of any size, I would say if you've got 10 nursing homes, you've got related parties. Okay, so what related parties are, it is companies that share the same ownership as the nursing home. So if you think the nursing home is owned by Granite Incorporated, but Granite Incorporated also owns a real estate holding company that holds the land and building that the nursing home has. Well, that's also owned by Granite and they lease the nursing home property to the nursing home licensee, the company that owns the nursing home license. They will also have, um, Granite will also own therapy companies, nurse agency companies, management companies, um, and it goes on and on and on. Um, mm -hmm. There are a couple of chains uh, that we have done a lot of uh, work on that have two dozen related party companies, all of whom are doing business with the nursing home. They're selling them supplies and they're renting them the building and they're leasing them equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Now, on the surface, related parties are not a problem, okay? They're just a way of doing business. And if you were gonna have to go out and hire a therapy company to provide therapists to your facility, you know, the idea is, well, if I'm gonna have to pay somebody to do that, why don't I create a company and capture that income stream myself? That's perfectly fine. The problem is 
in the nursing home sector, they are overpaying the related parties. And by doing that, they're able to manipulate their financial statements. So if you think about if I have a land and building and I'm renting it, you know, and, and it's just part of my nursing home and I'm paying $500,000 a year uh, to for, for insurance and taxes and a mortgage, it's costing me $500,000 to make that property available as a nursing home. But if I move that property over to a property company and then I lease it to the nursing home for $2 million, I now have an expense to my nursing home of $2 million. It used to be a half million. Mm -hmm. I used to make $2 million a year in profit. I just moved a million and a half of that profit into my, into my related property company. So now it only looks like I make a half a million dollars in profit. And so my income statement has been manipulated by overpaying the related party. And what you will see in these chains is they will do this with all the related parties. So that at the end of the day, the nursing home appears to be losing money every year, when in fact it is making substantial profits, but all the profits got moved into related parties. And here's the deal. Related parties don't file any type of financial reporting to CMS or any other government agency. So once the money passes into the related party, it disappears. Now, what we know is that money flows back up the back of the corporate chain to the owners, to the PE pool, if there's a PE pool, to a private owner, if it's a private owner. Um, all those, those profits are still flowing up to the owners, it's just which pocket the money flows through. And of course, the big issue that, that comes out of related party transactions is that by allowing those transactions to occur, the financial statements that are being filed with the federal government and with the state governments are not an accurate picture of the financial um, health of that nursing home. So after these nursing homes have manipulated those financial statements, they can then stand up in front of the legislators and say, oh, look, my nursing home loses money every year. I need more reimbursement. You know, <laughs> don't sue me, Mr. Plaintiff's attorney, because I killed your client. I don't have any money. You don't want to sue me. Hmm. Fact is, they're super profitable but they're hiding that profitability in related parties. Wow. Well, <laughs> so you brought up the subject and I'm going to jump on it about nursing homes providing poor care. In your opinion, is it because they're under-resourced or that they're not using their resources well? And also, how can we know that answer? How do, you, how do we figure it out? And what questions should, should legislators be asking? Sure. So the answer to that question is, um, I certainly see horrific care being delivered every day um, across the industry. Now, that does not mean every facility is bad that's in the United mm. States, but the ones that I'm dealing with regularly are very bad. You know, I make a joke that if I know a nursing home, you don't want to go there. Um, I don't know the best ones because I'm not going to end up being in litigation with the best ones. But by and large, I would say the average nursing home across the United States is understaffed um, and they will claim it is because they are under reimbursed. They need more reimbursement to get more staffing. What we have found in our litigation and in the litigation that I've helped with around the country is that's not true. The truth is the nursing homes have the amount of money necessary to run the nursing homes. They just aren't running them properly. So the question that you ask, are they 
you know, is this a question of reimbursement or is this a question of redistribution? And it's really a question of redistribution in most cases. They have the money and they're running it through related parties and then claiming they don't have any money. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're saying we need, you know, more money to do more staffing. But if you give them more money, they're not going to increase their staffing. We've seen that over the last few years. You know, when all the COVID money got injected into the nursing homes, we didn't see a staffing increase. We saw that money disappear. Um, and we know exactly where it went, it went to the owners. So the question, so so once you get to that question, is it reimbursement or is it or is it poor distribution? The answer to that can only be garnered through better financial transparency, um, which is one of the reasons I was up in Connecticut a couple of weeks ago was to talk to the legislators about uh, two different pieces of transparency legislation. One is about ownership transparency. So we were talking a few minutes ago about private equity. Well, you don't necessarily want to just say, oh, you private equity can't come into the market. Number one, defining it in, in, in such a way that you could actually prohibit it would be almost impossible. They'll just morph into something else and do the investment anyway. So it's better to understand is who owns them. So force anybody who is transacting businesses in a nursing home in Connecticut to file very detailed ownership documents that show who owns that nursing home back to a very small percentage. If you own more than 5% of this nursing home, your name is going to be in the registry. Well, once we get that, we can then start piecing together who all the chains are through that ownership, but you can no longer hide behind the opacity that, that is your investment vehicle. So that's one piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. The other piece of legislation is financial transparency. And that uh, legislation deals with the chain having to file consolidated, audited financial statements. So let me unpack that a little bit. First thing is audited. Audited means they have to have an outside CPA company audit their financial statements before they're filed, okay? So we no longer have the company filling out the, the, the financial statements, turning them in, and then when there's an error, they go, oh, we're sorry, our accounting department, you know, just fat-fingered that entry. No, no, no. You're going to have a monitor. Auditor's going to sign off on these are true statements. So that's number one. Consolidated financial statements means that the financial statements are from the very top of the company down. Right now, I you know tell people that um, if you look at nursing homes um, and you think about the tentacle of, say, an octopus, um, if I show you the last inch of an octopus, you're going to see some suckers, you're going to see it's a tentacle, you're going to say, oh, okay, yeah, I don't know what creature that is, but it's probably like an octopus or a squid or a cuttlefish, something like that. Well, we as consumers and taxpayers need to see the entire animal, okay? Right now, What's being filed for each nursing home is a cost report. And that cost report is the bottom inch of a tentacle. And that's it. That's all we're seeing. We're not seeing any of the transactions between the related parties, how much money is flowing up to uh, the ownership, anything like that. We're just seeing the very end of the tentacle. And we know those financial statements are manipulated by using related parties. So. Consolidated cost reports, or consolidated financial statements, grabs all of that financial data from the very top of the company all the way to the bottom. Now we're going to know this is a squid. And we can see the entire body and the full tentacles. And we can see how the money flows between the companies within the corporation. And at the end of the day, 
it's going to answer your question that I've spent 10 mm -hmm. minutes rambling on about, which is, is this a question about reimbursement? Or is this a question about how the money is allocated within the corporation? And once you have that information, you can sit there and see, holy moly, this company is making tens of millions of dollars of profits. We don't need to pay them more money. We need to put a staffing mandate on them that they staff more appropriately because they've clearly got the money for it. Now, mm -hmm. We've introduced this legislation in several other states, and the pushback that we've gotten from the industry has been massive. Um, and, you know, the two things I would say about that are, number one, if private equity is coming into a business sector, it is not because that sector is losing money. Private equity exists only to make profit. They are not charities. They don't care about health care. They don't care about your grandma. They care about, we want to make higher than market rates of return. We will get investments in any industry, doesn't matter which one, that will make us the most money. If they're in the nursing home market, and they are, it is not because they're losing money. Okay. They're looking to double their money in four to seven years. So if PE's here, there's profit here. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if I am a business owner that is losing money on every one of my nursing homes every year, and the legislators come to me and say, show us your financial statements and prove you're losing money, and we will give you more money. And not only do I refuse to show you that money or those financial statements, but I hire people to stand between me and you to make sure you can't get them. What does that tell you about that owner claiming that they're losing money? If they're really losing money, they should have opened those books instantaneously and said, mm -hmm. I'm losing money. Can I please have more money? But instead, they don't want the taxpayers and the general public to realize how profitable these nursing homes are and that they have scammed the American public for 30 years with this unified message of, we lose money, we need more reimbursement. On the backs of nursing home residents and their families. So Absolutely. Just, Absolutely. It's appalling. So, Absolutely. Thank you and, for telling us what's I'm underneath sure. it. That's really <clears throat> helpful. Well, and it's it's crazy that this type of scam has gone on for 30 years and mm -hmm. and nobody has really dug into it. I mean, the fact is, uh, this has been going on since at least the late 80s. And, um, and it's been super effective because the industry has managed its message. And the only message it sends out is, we don't have enough money. And so people just assume, oh, the nursing home has problems because it doesn't have enough money. Well, it's not that they don't have enough money from you and me. Is that the ownership isn't giving the actual nursing home enough of that reimbursement to do their job. And as you say, that is injuring residents all across the country every day. And, and I will say also that it is injuring the workers in these mm -hmm. facilities, okay? That is something that a lot of people don't consider is the rate of injury for nurses and nurses' aides that work in nursing homes is astounding. Um, the rate of burnout and, and mm -hmm. leaving the profession is also mm -hmm. very high because they are understaffed. And when you're understaffed, and you have an individual that needs two people to transfer them, and there's not another person to help you, and you try to do it by yourself, the patient could get hurt, the caregiver can get hurt, the family member can get hurt who's trying to assist the caregiver. So all of this pain and suffering occurs and none of us know how much profit the ownership is actually making. And I think that's wrong. I think as taxpayers, we should know 
where our tax money is going. And it's really an easy fix. Mm -hmm. Make them file consolidated audited financial statements. Yeah. And Ernie, I we could keep this conversation going. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for for days, probably. And it's always it's always such a pleasure to um you speak with you. I'm a little bit of a fangirl of like listened to all your webinars online. Um but we've just about run up against our time for today. So Ernie and Mary, do you have, do either of you have final thoughts or questions before we wrap up our conversation for today? How do we get the message out? People you know, that is, know this. yeah, it's hard. It's hard because of a couple of things. Number one, the general public doesn't want to think about nursing homes. They don't want to think about putting their parent in a nursing home. They don't want to think about them. Uh, they themselves getting old and possibly mm -hmm. needing to go to a nursing home. And it may not just be elderly. You know, there's also people in nursing homes that are, you know, motor, motor vehicle accidents that end up in nursing homes. So, but it's, it's a, it's an idea that people do not want to discuss. They don't want to think about it. It's like writing your will. People don't want to think about their mortality, even though every one of us is going to get there. And every one of us um, is either going to A, die, or B, go to a nursing home. Um, one of those is going to happen. So, um, so getting people to talk about it and think about it, number one, is it's a difficult subject. When you're talking about the legislature, you're talking about people who have a thousand decisions to make every day. We've spent the last 20 minutes talking about nursing homes and getting a legislator to sit down and have this discussion so they have some background when the industry shows up at their door wanting more money, it is very difficult to get the legislators to focus long enough to understand this message. This is you know, business finance, it's business entities. Um, there's a certain amount of accounting discussion that has to go on in these uh, discussions. And legislators getting them to sit down and have that discussion is difficult. So we can't expect to do that with all of them. But we have sat down with some of them. When I was up there a couple of weeks ago in Connecticut, we had several that we were able to meet with, get them to start understanding that this is a a, you know, basically a magic show. Let me show you how the money disappears. Well, I see my job as being the magician who comes along and breaks it for all the other ones and says, here, let me show you how it's done. It's not that difficult. Here's how you see through the magic. And so if we can get people to sit down and, and listen to these webinars and have these discussions, uh, we can get out and make a difference. Uh, the families make a difference and getting them involved. And unfortunately for a lot of them, it's too late. It's after the fact, after a bad incident at the nursing home has already happened, they get motivated to help be part of the change so other families don't have to go through what they went through. And then you've got groups like AARP, and, and other advocacy groups that can get out there and make a difference. Um, but we need to have a unified message. We need to be pushing for two things, ownership transparency and financial transparency. You get transparency in those two areas, we can fix nursing homes. Great, and that is such a good, doable note to end on. Um, so thank you again so much, um, Ernie Tosh, for taking the time to to be with us today and, you know, back in January for taking the time to to come up to Connecticut in what admittedly is the least pleasant month to. Um, <laughs> to oh, no, I thoroughly enjoyed it because you guys actually have seasons. We don't. We have hot and hotter. So <laughs> it was it was good getting up there. Good. Well, we we were honored to have you, uh, Mary. Thank you so much for um, you know your your ongoing advocacy, uh, your great questions today. We we appreciate having you on as our co-host. Um, so thank you again, um, Mary, Ernie, um, to Mike Humes, our communications director behind the scenes. 
Um, we hope everybody enjoyed today's conversation about nursing home financing, and we hope that everybody will join us again in two weeks for another episode of Coffee and Tea with AARP. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.